Airflow issues are extremely common in central air systems because the ductwork and balancing is so often overlooked. It's not unusual for us to have one vent blowing really strong and cold, while another one is at just a trickle in a room that is uncomfortable to be in. When I start the process of trying to diagnose airflow problems in a system or balance ductwork, I always begin with doing three things before I do anything else. First thing I want to do is I want to make sure all the registers in the rooms are wide open. I want to make sure there's nothing blocking them. I also want to make sure all the dampers in my ductwork are wide open. The reason for this is because I want to see what the system is actually doing when it has the full capacity to breathe. I don't want to start off with restrictions all over the place and then try to go around making adjustments. Second thing I want to do, and it should be obvious, I want to check the air filter. I want to make sure that's not really filthy and dirty restrictive. There's really no point in going on and diagnosing and making adjustments and just trying to compensate for something you've already missed. And number three, I want to make sure the system is running at its full capacity. I want to see not just what it's doing when it has the room to breathe, but what it's doing when it's working at its hardest. Now, if you have a two-stage heat or a two-stage cooling system, what you want to do is you want to set your thermostat five degrees above or below room temperature, depending on what mode you're in, when that would usually be enough to kick it into its second stage. However, if you have these smart systems, smart thermostats, that can often take about 10 or 15 minutes to do. All these logic features that are in these systems these days, they like to give the system that 10, 15 minute window to try to meet the demand. Um, and if it can't do it within that time frame, only then will it kick it into second stage. Now, there's ways around this. About smart thermostats that you do have a test mode that you can go into. And once you put it in that test mode, it'll kick in that second stage right away. Another option is you can go into the uh, control board on the unit itself and throw a jumper between Y1 and Y2. Although this is usually the best option if you have what's called a permanent split capacitor motor. Uh, you'll know when you take the cover off, you look at the motor, you see a capacitor literally mounted on the side of that. In some cases, you might just have to wait it out. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to get a snapshot on how hard this system is working overall. And to do that, I'm going to take a total pressure reading across the entire system. To do that, I'm going to use what's called a manometer. Now, I need two readings to do this. This is a dual manometer. It'll allow me to take both readings simultaneously. Um, but if you have one that only takes one reading, you could just take one, then the other, and do a little math. But the dual manometers do the math for you, so it's a little bit easier. So what I want to do to get this overall pressure reading on the system is I want to put one of my probes in the return ductwork. This is the air coming back from the house, going through the air filter and into the unit where the blower is. So I'm going to take one of my probes and when it comes to the placement of your probe in the ductwork, you want to find a place that's not going to have a lot of high turbulence. So you want to stay away from like elbows. You want to stay away from transitions in the ductwork like this up here. So I picked a nice little middle spot where it's a nice straight run for the air and there's going to be a minimum amount of turbulence. Now, before we use our manometer, we want to zero it out. So usually there's a button that just says zero. Um, and then we also want to make sure we're measuring in inches of water column. Now, when it comes to a static probe like this, on this side here, there's little holes. Um, and you want those holes to be perpendicular to the airflow. So what I mean here is my air is flowing in the return ductwork down this way. I want my holes to be facing to the sides perpendicular to that airflow. So when I put my probe in, I want this bent piece to be in the airflow. Now, it doesn't matter if it's up or down. Um, either way, the holes on the side are still going to be perpendicular. So if you don't believe me, you can put it up take the reading, switch it to down, take the reading, they should be pretty much the same. The only time that really makes a difference if you're dealing with a different type of probe uh, that has both the holes on the side and the tip, that is a uh, probe that takes static pressure plus velocity pressure. So it's not a pure static probe reading. Uh, all I want is static pressure. So make sure you're using the right probe for that. And that's our first measurement there. Now, my second measurement, I'm going to go on the supply plenum. This is where the cold air is coming out and being pushed into the rest of the house. And here, too, you want to take in consideration air turbulence. Now, in my situation, I have a very small plenum here with this spider arrangement, all these ducts coming off the side. So it's pretty chaotic in there, very wild, a lot of turbulence. 
So I want to keep it as low as I possibly can to the evaporator coil. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right into the side here, down near the coil, and I'm going to put my probe there, also into the airflow, so that my holes are perpendicular to that. Now, you might have heard a lot of people say, when you're taking a reading like this, not to include your air filter and not to include the evaporator coil. And that's certainly the case when your main focus is on the blower motor itself. Uh, but we're not here to focus on the blower right away. Uh, I'm more concerned with finding other problems in the airflow system, uh, problems with the duct work, problems with balancing, things of that nature. I don't go to the blower right away and bump up speeds to try to compensate for airflow issues. I want to make sure I have any other issues resolved first before I get to that. So um, the blower may be a point that I do revisit uh, in this process. But it's not the first thing it's due. I usually go to that last. The only time I will take a measurement in between the filter and the coil just to get the blower is if we're working with a 90% furnace. These furnaces, they have two heat exchangers in them. And that secondary heat exchanger acts a lot like evaporator coil. So I will get that isolated measurement to see how air is flowing through it. But otherwise, we're going to go big picture first and go from there. So you can see the uh, overall static pressure on the system is about 0 0.42, 0 0.43. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try to get an isolated reading on our filter and then an isolated reading on the evaporator coil. Now, when it comes to trying to get an isolated reading across your filter, a lot's going to really depend on where it's actually located. The filter is located right here just before the blower compartment. It's a very turbulent place as far as airflow goes. There's simply no way for me to get static pressure probes on both sides of that filter and get a reliable reading. It's just not going to happen. If you have one of these permanent split capacitor motors with a capacitor on the side, is that you can just take your overall reading like we just did, take your filter out, check that reading again, and the difference between the two will give you the pressure drop across the filter. However, if you have an ECM motor, this probably isn't going to work either. These ECM motors, they do adjust to maintain constant airflow or constant torque, so you still may not get a reliable reading. In these cases, what I typically like to do is I will just remove the filter entirely and I will throw in a fiberglass filter that they're, they're kind of called rock catchers because they don't really filter much. They're very thin, they offer very little resistance, and it's a small window with a pretty well-known value. It's 0.02 to 0.04 inches of water column. So I'll just split the difference, use 0.03, um, and then I'll go ahead with the rest of my diagnostic procedures using that particular number as just kind of like a baseline. Once I go through my whole procedure of finding out if there's any problems with the duct system, once it's balanced, I can always come back, put the original filter back in, take a look at things real quick again, and if at that point uh, we see issues when we put the filter back in, then we know what we need to address next. Maybe we need to go a different type of filter, different brand of filter, or whatever, but um, we're still figuring out issues. We're just taking different paths to get there. So. Right now, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go with the 0.03 as a static pressure. So our total system pressure was about 0 0.43. 0 0.03 of that, we'll say it's the filter. And now we're going to do the evaporator coil. Now, to get our pressure drop reading across the evaporator coil, we want our probes to be just above and just below it. Now, my probe just above is the same spot I used to get our overall system pressure, so I'm just going to leave it right there. The other one I'm placing right in the furnace, right at the top of it, just below the coil itself. Now, there is a heat exchanger in there. You want to be very careful if that's the hole you're going to drill. You don't want to be using long drill bits or anything like that. A uh, nice small little cone bit with a hole just big enough to get your probe in is all you really need. Now the pressure drop I'm seeing across the coil right now is 0.25. Uh, that is a little on the high end for an A coil that is wet. And what I mean by wet is when the warm air from the house that has humidity and it travels over it and cools down, that humidity condenses and it creates moisture on the coil itself. And that moisture adds a little bit of resistance. So the wet coil reading is 0.25 and that is a little on the high side for a coil. Generally, what you want to see on these types of coils is 0.1 to 0.15. That is a clean, wet coil. Sometimes you might have these really high efficiency units and the uh, pressure drop might be a little bit bigger. You might see as high as 0.20 and that's okay. 
0.25 is at the high end. That's telling me this coil is a little bit dirty and it's time to clean it. It's certainly not something I need to do right now, um, but that is something I'm going to take care of within the next couple of weeks. So now I've identified at least a partial problem, some that, that could be contributing to some of the airflow issues we have, um, but it's probably not a main cause. We just know that is something we can do to make improvements. So here's where we stand. We measured our total system pressure at 0.43 inches of water column. We put our rock catcher filter in for 0.03 inches of water column. Our evaporator coil is at 0.25 inches of water column, which we identified as a, an issue that we have to address soon. And now you can see that leaves our ductwork at 0.15 inches of water column. When we add up the evap coil on the filter, that leaves us with 0.15 left over from that 0.43. Now, a lot of you right now might be thinking that's really high. We should be seeing 0 0.08, that prototypical friction rate everybody swears by. Uh, but one thing you have to keep in mind here is we're dealing with a house that's 112 years old. And anybody who's ever installed a central air conditioning system in a house that old knows it is a real pain in the butt to get from point A to point B. My longest run here in this house is all the way on the second floor in the back side of the house. So I would say it's about 80 feet once you include all the fittings in it. And that's contributing to this 0.15 inches of water column. If you look at this run right here, this is a run to our kitchen on the first floor. And it's maybe 10 feet long and then goes boom right to the floor into the kitchen. Uh, we have another run right behind it up above it here. Uh, that run is only about four feet from the plenum and then boom right into the art room on the first floor. We have another one back there just like it five feet right into the living room. And these are very straight, very short, low resistance paths for the airflow. And airflow is always going to follow the path of least resistance. Meanwhile, I got those long runs going all the way upstairs on the second floor, twisting and turning through walls and everything. And that's where that back pressure is coming from. Now, the problem is, is that the air, you know, despite that high pressure, the air is going to be pushed through these very short runs. And this is exactly why I never just come in and bump up lower speeds to try to compensate for airflow issues on like the first or second floor, whatever the problem may be. I may be just making the problem even worse by increasing that pressure, increasing the tendency of the air to want to follow the path of least resistance. And what I can end up doing is even pushing more air to downstairs, less air upstairs, and making the problem even worse. So now we're ready to go through and try to balance some of this out by balancing the system. And to do that, we're going to start off with some basic readings using an anemometer. So this is a little wind vane. And ideally, when you're using these, uh, it would be good to do it in CFMs, but not all of these do that. This one does, but you have to keep changing the duct diameter every time you go to a different grill. So just to keep this really simple and basic, I'm going to go by velocity or feet per minute. Now, when you're doing that, what you're generally looking for is between 400 feet per minute on the low end to 900 feet per minute on the top end. And this is still going to tell me where the bulk of the airflow is going, where it's the strongest, where it's the weakest, and where I can make adjustments. That's all I'm really looking for right now. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go to all the registers in the house, um, and then we'll see where we can kind of make adjustments, where we can take air from. But I kind of feel like I already know which ones I can back off on. So here are all the readings uh, in all the rooms in the house, and you can see right away the short runs I was talking about there. The living room, the art room, the kitchen, they're all between 730, 850 feet per minute, pretty decent airflow. And you can see how all the rooms upstairs are barely at or even below that 400 feet minimum I was talking about, with the only exception being that bedroom number three. So my first move here is the living room and the art room. Both of these rooms never get any direct sunlight. We do keep the shades closed for privacy. These are the coolest rooms in the house. So I'm going to back off on the dampers feeding into these rooms. The kitchen at 850, that's the strongest one. Uh, I would not touch that just because there is the stove there. There's cooking. There's people. There's a high heat load there. Now, closing off on the living room and the art room might increase that. And I'm already near that 900 feet per minute kind of limit. So I may actually have to back off in that a little bit anyway. Um, so let's just start with those two rooms and see where we have uh, from there. I know it's a weird angle, but it's up here in the bay. 
Um, this is the damper for my living room. I'm going to go about halfway with that one. I just want to see what that does. This ducked up here. That is our art room. My damper's right back here. I'm also going to go about halfway with that one as well. So let's go upstairs. Let's check those two girls again. And we'll also check the kitchen to see if a little more air was pushed that way as well, which I'm expecting it did. So here's our living room. We brought it from 7.30 down to about 5.50, 5.75. Maybe just a little below 600. So that's fine. Let's move on to the art room. Let's see what we got there. Now this one we definitely kicked up. I was expecting the kitchen to do that, but it happened in the art room. Uh, so I'm going to go down and back off on that a little bit. But let's take the kitchen one real quick before we do that. All right, so here's the kitchen. We took a little bit of a decrease, not a lot. So I'm going to go ahead. Let's go back down, back off on that art room. We did see an increase in the art room. Now it's over that 900 feet per minute. That's too much. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to close down on that art room again a little more. I'm going to see if we could push a little more airflow towards the upstairs. And we'll recheck the kitchen again to see if that increased as well. All right, so we got our art room back down below that 900 limit. We're about 825, which is great. Um, so we're going to go check the kitchen real quick, and then we'll move on upstairs and see what we have up there. Okay, so as you can see, we pushed that back up to about that 900 feet per minute in the kitchen. Um, and I'm actually really good with that because this is always the hottest room in the house. Uh, it also kind of feeds into the dining area a little, which really isn't all that big, but... Um, this is perfect. We're going to leave it just like that. So let's go upstairs and see what we got there. So this is our velocity at bedroom one. We were at 400 feet per minute prior to all this. We're now at around 750, which is beautiful. Here we are at bedroom two, and this was the biggest improvement overall. Our initial velocity was, I think, 325 feet per minute. I mean, it was really low. We pretty much doubled it to 650, almost 700. Now, this room's a little bit smaller than the first one, so that's great. That's really good right there. So here we are, bedroom three. Not much of a change. We're at 600 feet per minute before. We're right there now. We didn't have any problems with this room at all, so that's good. Nothing changed. Everything's status quo here. Now we're back in the walk-in closet. We had an issue here as well before. I think it was 375 feet per minute. Now we're back up to about 600, which is beautiful. And finally, the second floor bathroom. Not much of a drastic change here. Um, even though it's down close to that lower end of the uh, velocity ratings of 400 to 900, I'm perfectly okay with it being there because this floor grill is about a foot away from the toilet and everybody complains how cold it is when they go to the bathroom. So that's fine. All right, so Good at this point, there. I can keep tweaking it. I can keep dialing it in more and more, but we really made some drastic improvements here. So I'm pretty happy where things are now. So one last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take that big picture uh, static pressure test again, see what we have, see if anything radical changed there. Overall, we went from 0.43 to about 0.48, 0.49, still below that 0.5 inches of water column, which is really good. So yeah, that's pretty much about it. Uh, I think we did pretty good here. A couple weeks, I'm probably going to clean this coil, do a real quick check around, and hopefully that helped you guys out. Thanks for watching. Hopefully I'll see you next one.